I'd like to welcome Guy Benari. He came today from Ljubljana to us, where he's currently exhibiting, exhibiting the work Self, and Self will be uh, a part of his presentation, I'm sure. Self is also uh, a part of our exhibition in the Kunstraum down the hall. If you haven't seen it yet, maybe you can have a look later on. We actually wanted to bring self as an installation, but there was an overlap with the gallery in uh, Ljubljana, so finally we could only present you a documentation of the project in our exhibition. Uh, luckily, we had the chance to work with Guy Benari earlier, so um, we have another series here in Berlin, it's called Technosphären Klänge, that's a project together with the House of World Cultures where we investigate into sound, art, and technology. And uh, in this framework, Guy Benari brought the self-installation to Germany the first time, and we presented it um, last year, it was, no? Exactly, last year, 2017. And uh, yeah, Guy Benari is a Perth-based artist and researcher, and he works there in an institution called Symbiotica, which uh, is a place where artists and scientists collaborate closely together at the University of Western Australia. And um, yeah, his lecture will be about a range of different projects that he has done over time and is currently working on in which uh, robotic embodiment, bioengineered living matter play a fundamental role and he will discuss the aesthetic and ethic questions raised through his work. And I'd like to welcome Guy Benari. Um, it was really heartbreaking that we couldn't um, come with self to um, CTM, <laughs> um, especially um, in light of all the uh, quite amazing um, lineup um, of the festival. But um, that's life. Um, so, I think that it's actually quite interesting for me, at least. It was very interesting to, for me to hear um, uh, Marco talking about his work because I, I think itself is kind of, it's, it's very similar, but it's very different kind of proposition to kind of those bodies that uh, Marco and those networks that Marco was talking about because here um, there's no kind of human body. We're not talking about a human body that is working collaboratively or as a hybrid with technology. In this kind of project, what we did is we took parts of a body to create another body um, and kind of um, um, juxtapose it with um, technology. Um, but before we talk about self, I just want to talk about a few um, things. So as Jan said, I'm from Symbiotica. It's a, um, a research lab in the uh, School of Anatomy and Human Biology in uh, the University of Western Australia. It's quite a unique lab because it's an artistic run lab that is located in a science faculty. Um, and, you know, we are artists that are engaging with biological technologies and we formalize our relationship with the science faculty. So, you know, we work there as equals. You know, we have access to all the labs. We are part of the science faculty um, and we've been there for 20 years. Um, it's quite a unique place. There's a residency program, quite a live, lively residency program, and um, artists are coming um, to Perth, which is kind of <laughs> um, funny, from all over the world. So um, I consider myself to be a researcher, an artist, um, and you know, the world um, that I live in or operate within is the world of new media, um, where emerging technologies are those tools or this, it's a palette um, that I'm using and trying to probe and problematize. Um, the materials that I usually use are biological. Um, some would call it bioart. Um, you know, the palette of materials are living systems. Um, in my research, uh, I've done a few things, but in kind of the work or the body of work that I'm going to talk about today, I've been working mainly with neurons, not the artificial neural networks uh, um, that are kind of um, computer programs that are modeled um, upon the way neural network works, but the real neural networks, biological neural networks. Um, and you know, I mean, what I do in my studio or the lab is basically I grow 
um, and make a tiny bit, but you know, it's kind of almost like advanced gardening um, in the lab. Um, the strategy is that um, we kind of usually try to um, use um, our, because we're using biotechnologies and you know, those technologies are quite profound. They're, they're technologies that, um, and I'll get uh, more into it uh, in a second, but those technologies are changing who we are, changing our bodies. Um, and, you know, I mean, we now can create life in labs or we can extend life in labs or we create different um, entities in the labs. Um, and it's really important to kind of look at those technologies um, in a critical way. And the idea here is to problematize, not to really celebrate those technologies, but to problematize those technologies. Um, and in my case, usually by kind of suggesting um, worlds under construction or contestable future, uh, futures, um, but also kind of add some sort of a layer of humor to kind of ease the um, viewers into the um, discussion. So I got just a kind of couple of words about art and science. I mean, this is, um, you know, if 20 years ago it was um, quite a unique um, way of working, although uh, throughout the history of art, um, there was always um, artists that were interested in science. But, you know, the artists that are kind of using technologies in the lab, the motivation of the artist um, that uh, research new development in technology or science is different to the scientists, to the technologies. It's not about profit or primary utilization. Um, the artist undertakes to develop tools that help realize an artistic goal or cultural agenda. So it's a totally different thing. I mean, we are working quite a lot with scientists in the labs and we, it, it, there's no clash usually between the way we kind of work, but it's really interesting to see how we kind of using the same technologies, we even kind of um, prepare, or doing the same experiments, but at one point, we just kind of walk our ways. Um, we're not there to collect data. We're not to, there to find cure to anything. We're there to kind of perform more um, cultural experiments and kind of um, look at the, the effect is the, of those technolo technologies to probe it, to poke it, to be playful with it, to be critical with it. Um, and as I said, to suggest those contestable futures that allows us to kind of evaluate those technologies. Um, so the cultural commentary and the deconstruction of hidden narratives in scientific and cultural structures are very important and this is what we're trying to do um, in our work to critique the idealized vision of science. I mean, there's this thing where, you know, the lay person kind of learns and knows about science from the media and usually it's kind of using words and terms and vocabulary that are not really communicative so they're kind of leaving it to the scientists and um, there's some sort of an ide um, a vi I idealization of the vision of science. And, you know, the art or the kind of pract our practice is to try to mi demystify it, to kind of bring it into galleries and to kind of generate this kind of discussion about those fu the futures of, all, of those technologies. Um, this is a quote, I'm just going to read it, but um, I think that uh, by Oron Katz, he's the director of Symbiotica, and I think that this quote is kind of nailing or kind of putting the framework to most of the works that are happening in Symbiotica. So the form and the application of our newly acquired knowledge will be determined by the prevailing ideologies that develop and control the technology. When the manipulation of life takes place in an atmosphere of conflict or profit-driven competition, the long-term results might be disquieting. One role that art can play is to suggest scenarios of worlds under construction and subvert technologies for the purpose of creating contestable objects. The role of art makes the emergence of semi-livings or the living entities that we make as evocative art objects and the multi-level exploration of their use relevant and important. And, you know, when I, uh, I kind of prepared slides for a talk that I gave last month um, in Perth, and uh, while preparing this uh, presentation, I kind of read The Guardian, and this article was just, um, um, just kind of popped uh, in front of my eyes, and it kind of, and there's so many other um, e examples of that, but this is, it's such a good example of what Oren was saying. The um, technology, U.S. military agencies invest $100 million in genetic extinction technologies. Technology could be used to wipe out uh, malaria, 
um, carrying mosquitoes or other pests, but the UN experts say that fears over possi the possible military use and unintended consequences and strengthen the care of a ban. Um, so it just kind of demonstrates how important it is to kind of look at those technologies, to regulate them, to, and to be very critical of them. So when we're talking about the technologies, um, what sort of um, tools do I use in the lab um, to um, create my art? Um, coming from a robotics background, I kind of divided them roughly into kind of three categories that are very uh, kind of taken from this world. There's the hardware, the software, and the so sensors. The hardware that I use in my art, or in this kind of line of work that I'm presenting today, are the neurons. Those are cells, um, brain cells, that are growing outside of the body. They're using um, techniques that are called tissue culture and tissue engineering. It's a very old technique that's been around for 100 years. And it tells us that you can actually grow cells, mammalian cells or plant cells, outside of the body. Um, so this is the hardware that I use. The software um, that I'm kind of manipulating, um, hacking actually, is taken from a stem cell technology called induced pluripotent stem cells. So that technology tells us that we can now take cells out of our body, whatever cell it is, it can be a skin cell for instance, and then we can reprogram those cells, we can take them back in time, we can reverse engineer those cells to become something else. It's what I call um, the biological alchemy, you know, the, the black magic. You, know, you, get, you take water and you get gold. You take a skin cell and you end up with a neuron. And it's important because when we're starting to grow neurons, the question is how many of them do we need to grow in order to create a real brain? There's no answer to that right now, but it's a bit disturbing or uh, disquieting, as Oren kind of said. Um, the manipulation of the software is done through the nuclei, through the genes of the cell. So basically you insert new genes into the cell and then you kind of hack the life cycle of the cell and take it back in time to become a stem cell. And then stem cells can be differentiated into any other type of cells in the body. So really, we can manipulate the basic units of our body and, you know, as artists, what we're trying to do is to kind of use them as building blocks for new entities or in, to build things in new kind of form. And the sensors um, is a piece of technology that I've been working with for quite a while. It's called the multi-electrode array, um, the multi-electrode array um, dish, and I'll show you a picture of it, but basically imagine it's a little Petri dish, and whoever doesn't know what a Petri dish is, it's like a little dish um, that we grow the neurons inside. But on the bottom of this dish, there are 64 electrodes, a grid of eight by eight electrodes that the neurons grow on them. And when we grow the neurons on them, the neurons form a network spontaneously. They start growing in a network immediately, and they start producing their action potentials or the neural activity immediately, although very um, random. So when you grow them on those um, 64 electrodes, it means that in 64 areas of the dish, the area that they grow on, you can listen to what they're doing. You can actually record the electric signals that they're firing. This is how they communicate. This is how our brain works. The network is firing um, the action potentials. But what's more, what was more interesting for me was that not only that we can listen to what the neurons are doing, we can stimulate back the neurons. So in 64 areas of the dish, we can actually talk back to the neurons. We can inform them about what's happening in the outside world. If, I'm not sure if they'd be very interested in that. Um, we can um, try to entrain them. We can stimulate them and see whether they respond to it and change their functional plasticity accordingly, change the way they work, change the way they control. Um, and, you know, in this whole uh, uh, talk, I'm talking about the brain, you know, the, 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 my external brain. I'm growing my external brain, and I use a lot of the word brain, and I feel that it's very important to qualify it. I am not growing a brain. Um, it's a neural network. It's two-dimensional, and it has only 100... Um, um, 100,000 cells compared to the billions of cells that we have in our brain and trillions of synapses. And our brain is three-dimensional and it evolved for 
you know, millions of years, and every neuron in our brain is in its place for a reason. This network is quite um, small. It's very symbolic. But although it's symbolic, it still produces a huge amount of data. It's still um, subject to a lifespan, and it still responds to stimulations. So it's like a model. It's a symbolic model of a brain. And for the sake of um, this talk, but also the vocabulary of the project, it's an art project, not a science project, I refer to it as a brain or my external brain. Um, so this is the um, multi-electrode array. You can see that um, it, it's a close-up, so you don't see the 64 electrodes. Um, the electrodes end up with this kind of blob, the round um, circle around them, and, and the, the neurons kind of grow on top of them. So this image was taken with the microscope kind of looking up at the dish. And each one of those electrodes can record the electric signals of the neurons that are sitting onto it and just around it. This is how the um, dish looks. Um, this, is kind of, this is how the dish looks like. And I was going to show you uh, this uh, movie. And this is kind of a really simple visual, uh, visualization and uh, sonification of the neural activity. So you can imagine this is um, an 8 by 8. It's plotted 8 by 8 um, points that show how the neurons respond. And at the beginning of this movie, they just kind of work spontaneously. And at one point, they're starting to respond to stimulations. So you kind of get an idea how it looks. So the neurons, when we kind of plate them up, they immediately start to kind of uh, produce electric signals. They are active. And then we start stimulating them. And then the question, the $1 million question, is whether those stimulations would cause them to change the way they are. Um, there's a lot of science that is done um, on that. And there's a lot of papers that suggest um, that indeed it happens. But it's not a um, clear fact. You know, it's not done done deal. It's, it's an ongoing research. And when I started to kind of uh, work in symbiotic, I uh, was really interested in intelligence and I was very interested in, in consciousness and, you know, kind of looking at a lot of the cognitive science, uh, science and looking at how the brain works. But then I kind of realized that I can actually deconstruct it and maybe kind of look at neural networks, look at only the networks themselves. And, you know, I started to grow them, but I, you know, from just growing them, you can't understand anything, what's happening there. And then I started to take um, time-lapse photography of them so I could visualize them and using uh, electrophysiology so I could almost hear what they're doing. But in order to um, really see what they're doing and if their, their behavior is changing or to kind of tap into their kind of um, erratic existence um, through the... I was looking for ways to kind of tap into what is happening there through uh, to uh, look at um, how to manifest their erratic existence. I realized that it's only through movement and behavior that I could do that. And previous projects of mine um, looked at those brains and tried to embody them with robotic bodies. So the embodiment, giving those networks or brains a body, was almost a necessity for me to kind of try to kind of interact with them and learn um, um, what is happening with those kind of networks. So when we work with, you know, I mean, I worked with, uh, worked with different type of um, um, living systems in uh, my career and different type of cells, but really when you work with neurons, there's kind of an uneasiness, an uneasiness that you just can't avoid because neurons traditionally are kind of believed to be in masses, um, the source of intelligence, you know? And you just can't really um, ignore that. So, and, and it's interesting because this uneasiness in the lab always kind of drew me to kind of try and look at it even further. Um, but, you know, questions like what directions will current and emerging biotechnologies take us in the future? What are the responsibilities to uh, liminal lives? 
um, they create and what kind of ethical boundaries will we need to be uh, will need to establish what sort of reg regulations um, around these living um, liminal entities those are the kind of general questions are people that are working with um, um, living system but when you work with neurons it's even more profound artists that are uh, artworks that are using neurons have the potential to evoke or elicit responses in regards to the shifting perceptions surrounding the understanding of life by bringing bringing possible scenarios to life to life neural networks confront the viewer both instinctively as well as intellectually by calling into question the liveliness of the different categories of life death human and non-human so keeping that in mind we started to kind of um, thinking about what, what are we going to do with that and me art was the first project that we developed I'm not going to talk a lot about me because I'm here to talk more about self the project that is um, presented through its documentation in the exhibition um, on the first floor but Mert was the first um, work that we embodied the um, neural networks with a um, uh, a robotic body it was a drawing machine you know we kind of try to kind of think try to kind of build a robot or make a new robot develop a robot that had the least utilitarian kind of um, um, you know we try to make it the least utilitarian and we kind of because when we work with the scientists you know it was always get the neurons to navigate or get try to get the neural network to navigate try to get the neural uh, network to go to the center or so these are kind of the, the way the scientists kind of think and we try to kind of think about the uh, a non utilitarian kind of task and what's more non utilitarian than being an artist so um, we gave those neurons a body that can draw pictures and we asked those uh, neurons to um, paint or draw um, um, portraits of viewers in the gallery um, and there was a feedback loop so there was a camera that was looking at the progression of the drawing that sent information back to the neurons as stimulations and there was a process of correcting their drawings and of course the neurons didn't draw portraits and it looked like a scribble of a three-year-old but there was um, a, a definite feedback loop between the um, neurons and um, the robot itself and then we um, developed Silent Barrage, which uh, reflected. So, so this happened when I was in Porter's lab in a residency, and I kind of looked, I kind of realized that, you know, most of the, um, um, a, a lot of the time that the scientists spent was to kind of look down the microscope at this dish. And I kind of realized that this dish is basically a site for performance. This is where the performance is happening inside the Petri dish. So this project is kind of um, amplifying this um, environment and um, we created 32 to correlate with the 64 electrodes robots that um, uh, um, had articulated cartridges that went up and down and kind of drew in certain points that the neurons directed them um, and the stimulations were generated by the presence of um, the um, um, viewers in the space and it was quite interesting to see kind of how people engage with that because the minute that they started to understand that it's alive and that there are kind of neurons they started you know people spend a lot of time in this space and some excuse me some got very emotional about that um, so it was it was interesting to see how the human and the non-human um, 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 communicates but at that point, those two projects, I worked with neural networks that were made from um, uh, neurons that were taken from mice and rats. And I wanted to move away from that, even though in Symbiotica, every project goes through the ethical committees of the university and everything is kind of has a rubber stamp that it's OK. But I didn't feel that it's OK because, it, you know, to me, it was almost like appropriating another species. But I couldn't if I wanted to use neurons, I had to use neurons of other kind of species because I couldn't take my own of course I would kind of harm myself um, and I didn't want to do that so when I learned about the um, IPS technology I thought to myself well that's great why don't I make neurons but and, and just to kind of start testing this technology that was hailed as the technology of the decade without you know in the media there was no kind of mention of the dark side of this technology and this is what I was kind of trying to kind of look at um, the technology that I described before that you can actually take adult cells reprogram them and then create 
other specialized cells in the body. Um, this technology kind of solved the problems of stem cells and the research of stem cells of the right wing and religious people. Um, and, you know, but, and, and there was a lot of promise in kind of um, clinical trials. So, you know, I mean, we can take cells from patients and then grow stem cells for them and inject it back, back to their bodies. But no one really, um, at that point, no one really talked about the um, ethical difficulties that this pr um, uh, technology poses. And there's so many of them, but just to kind of mention kind of a proposition where, you know, you could harvest cells from yourself, reprogram them to become, if a male, an ova, and then fertilize it with your own sperm to become the father and the mother of your own child, which is kind of in a horrific um, um, scenario. And there's a few other kind of ways that you, this, this technology can really um, take us to um, problematic places. So in order to do that, uh, the first project that I wanted to comment about this technology, I called um, as a working title, Project Dickhead. And what I did is I kind of purchased in an online catalog cells that were taken um, from a foreskin. This kind of picture doesn't have foreskin, but from foreskin, um, um, you can buy them online. It's not a problem. And I took this, um, those cells and I grew them and then I reprogrammed them to make a brain. So I took cells from a penis and I made a brain out of that um, project dickhead. The funny thing is that um, uh, the funding body that I got the money from, um, you know, they called me. I, I applied for a fellowship to do that and they called me and they said, well, we have good news and bad news. The good news is that you got your fellowship. The bad news is that the Minister for the Arts, in the, the Federal Minister for the Arts in Australia, refused to sign off this project because of the name. Um, so I had to change the name. So I changed it to In Potentia, and it kind of looked like that. And, you know, this, in this project, the neurons weren't interactive, you know. They, we just put it on a pedestal. We showed them like a piece of jewelry, and we kind of asked, and, you know, according to the um, Australian law, if you think, or if your brain is um, active, you can be considered as a person, which is a very problem, problematic um, definition because, you know, what, what happens with people in coma, for instance. So kind of to challenge those perceptions of, um, A, what it is to be a person, what it is to be alive, what it is to be a human. Um, we took human skins, uh, human cells from uh, foreskin and made a brain. We put it on a pedestal and we asked, is this dickhead a person? So in this kind of project, um, and the culture is, over, yeah, it's in this little petri dish. You, can, you can't really see it. So, you know, we had kind of a couple of projects looking at the embodiment of neural networks with robotics. And then there was this transition of wor um, working with um, material that is taken or harvested from humans. And then I kind of thought of taking everything that I've done in this kind of line of work and use my own cells to create a self-portrait. And that's the project that I'm here to talk about. It's called Self. Um, it is a self-portrait of mine. I got um, the funding to create a biological self-portrait. But um, soon enough, I understood that um, there's no way that I can do it by myself. Um, it's a very complex project that took four years to um, develop and required quite a lot of skill. So this is the um, team. Nathan is the designer and fabricator and did a lot of DIY um, work. Andrew Fitch is an electric engineer that did the neur neural interface and the synthesizers. Darren Moore is a musician that we worked on sound and aesthetics. And Douglas, Stewart, and Mike are all um, scientists that I didn't want to kind of leave out of this list as consultant. They were part of this project and we worked all um, together. So it's a, it was quite a um, big team that developed this project. So self started with what we could see uh, or can be seen as a materialist question underpinned by the relief, uh, belief that artistic practice can act as a vector of thought. What is the potential for artworks using biological and robotic technologies to evoke or, respond, or elicit responses in regards to the shifting perceptions surrounding the understanding of life and the materiality of the human body? And you can see that there's, it's kind of almost like a theme that is re uh, repeated through um, my works.
So when I started it, so biological self-portrait, you know, I never studied art and I never went to art school and I did, never did a self-portrait. Um, and I can't paint or draw or make sculptures. So um, I didn't really know what to do, but I just kind of thought, okay, first of all, if you follow this kind of look, just kind of work with your, uh, just create this brain that you um, think, uh, want, you know, and then kind of let's look at what sort of embodiment uh, would fit it to kind of um, qualify as a self-portrait. So I went to the hospital, got a, a doctor that um, was willing to um, perform a biopsy on my arm and he kind of harvested this kind of piece of flesh out of my arm and then I kind of packed it in this falcon tube with media solution to keep it alive. And I rent, you know, kind of looking at it here in the parking. Um, and I rent to the Symbiotica Labs. This kind of piece of flesh in this Petri dish, that's kind of the source of all the material that I'm using and probably would ever use in my art career. Um, I have billions of cells, billions of cells um, in dif different kind of formats that came out of this um, piece of flesh. And we processed it, and those are my uh, skin cells that are growing um, in vitro outside our body. So those are skin cells, they proliferate. You can see how they kind of lift up, and then they divide into two, lift up to create a shiny ball, and then they divide into two. It's a timeless photography taken over 12 hours. And, you know, I mean, I kind of... It was interesting because the first time that I looked at the, my skin cells under the microscope, it was almost like a relief. I, I don't know, I felt kind of, because it looks exactly like skin cells of rats, mice, other species. And I kind of felt, oh, you know, we're all very close. Um, so the first part was just to grow stalks and stalks of skin cells. And those are the cells that I have quite a lot in the um, like with nitrogen in Symbiotica. And once I had um, those um, stocks of skin cells, then the next step w was to try and reprogram them to turn them into... Um, um, stem cells. So I um, went to um, a residency in the University of Barcelona, worked with a friend of mine, um, uh, Mike Adele, and it was really nice because his lab was next to Santiago Cajal's lab, one of the, the father of neuroscience and one of the first ones that actually drew. He was a great um, painter, a drawer. Um, he drew neurons and this is one of his pictures and he kind of said that every man can, if he so desires, to be the sculptor of his own brain. So I kind of related to that. So I worked in the lab, it's kind of the money shot of a bioartist. And, um, and, you know, I mean, the cover, the head, the head of, or the, you know, covering your mouth and the head is because the reprogramming was done with um, viruses. So it's kind of a class two and quite dangerous um, work. Um, and those are the stem cells. It's the clump in the middle, not the cells around them. Stem cells grow kind of in colonies and they, they grow in a very um, dense kind of way. And then we took those cells and refroze them, and which is kind of an interesting idea as well, that in le that level of life, we can actually freeze it and reanimate it later on, which kind of tells us that really we, we kind of lack the vocabulary to describe different types of life. You know, are we alive like these kind of cells? Um, can we be, you know, I mean, um, we, we can't freeze ourselves well yet. Uh, and um, do similar things. So, yeah, we froze those cells, we sent them to Perth, to Symbiotica, and then I went through kind of a long and very painful process of understanding of how to differentiate those um, stem cells to neurons. Um, one of the things that I always insist is to do the work myself, the biological work. I don't want to commission artists, uh, scientists to do the work for me. So it was and, and uh, there was a lot of difficulties, which are kind of a bit boring right now. So it took me two years or two, one and a half, 18 months um, to do that. But I managed to um, differentiate my cells into neurons. And see, so the stem cells are in the top right corner. 
and you can see this is day seven to differentiation where the kind of neurons are the kind of black round, the neural bodies are the black round um, objects. And you can see how the processes grow and they're kind of trying to find um, more processes to create synapses and to kind of make the, um, if you look at the end of those processes, make the network more complex. So again, this was a uh, time-lapse movie that was taken over 48 hours. But it clearly shows how the neural networks form. I'm going to stop it here. And then we went through characterization just to prove that what we think that our neurons are neurons um, using biological kind of tools. It's staining. That's another one. And then we learned how to grow them over the multi-electrode array um, because we wanted to get some sort of interactivity. And that's actually the, a picture of the dish, the first dish that I um, managed to... Um, record electric activity and it was those two electrodes that were producing the electric activity. So then I started to kind of think about, to kind of take myself out of the development of the scientific, or out of the scientific processes of developing uh, the material or kind of getting to know the material really well. And I started to think about the um, self-portraiture again. And, um, you know, that was after two, two and a half years of looking at myself down the microscope and I could not bear the thought of doing a self-portrait because I had enough of myself, um, especially that, you know, the process was so painful and so lengthy. So I decided to not portray myself, rather to portray one of my childhood dreams. Um, and I was kind of thinking about what did I want to, what did I want to be when I was 12 years old? And the answer was um, a rock star, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I wanted to become David Bowie when I was 12. And that was it. So I decided to kind of, instead of um, portray myself, to give my external brain a sound producing body to make a cybernetic musician, a living instrument, but more than that, a cybernetic um, musician. So it kind of became like a quest of becoming a rock star. And then I Thought to my, I, I started to think about what sort of musical instrument would I give my external brain. Um, I definitely didn't want to hook it to a computer and to um, generate sound. Um, I thought about kind of various kind of, uh, to kind of create various robotic instruments myself. But then talking to my friend um, and a collaborator, Darren Moore, we realized that um, the modular analog synthesizers is the obvious choice. And there's a few reasons for that. The first one is that um, the aesthetics is very similar to the aesthetics of the electrophysiology labs. But much more importantly, we realize that the way the, neuron, the neurons are analog and that the way the neurons work where components of the network are kind of interacting with each other to create voltages are very, very and the voltages are going through those components it's a very, very simple, con uh, similar concept to the way the analog modular synthesizers work with a CV, with a controlled voltage that is going through the components to create data. In both cases, voltages are flowing between the components to create data. So we decided to kind of juxtapose them and to kind of embody those neural networks with an analog modular synthesizers and in that way to create one network. So this, the signal flows from the microvolts through the amplifier to the analog synthesizers with no computers, with no programming, with no microcontrollers. There is no computers, there's nothing digital in this um, um, project. It's all pure analog or what we refer to wetalog and analog. But there's a continuum of flow of signal from the neural networks to the point where you get sound. The only thing that is done in the middle is amplification from millivolts to volts so that the synthesizers could actually, um, um, you know, work with it. And 
when we did that, we kind of realized that um, David Tudor, he was a piano player and a, um, a musician, a scholar. The, he, w he was the piano player that played the um, 4.33 famous piece of John Cage. He, in the 90s, created the first synthesizer that was driven by an artificial neural network. And in one of his writings, he's talking about the fact that in one day, this sort of piece would be controlled by real living um, um, networks. So it was quite um, interesting and quite nice for us to kind of um, take his vision and put it out there. But I didn't want to be a musical instrument. I wanted to be a rock star. So just kind of hooking the um, neurons to a synthesizer wasn't really enough for me. I wanted to play with musicians. And it's, it's also to do with the fact that Darren Moore, my friend and collaborator, the musical director of this project, he is a jazz musician and I, a really good friend of mine. And it was like a bad joke between us that I always wanted to kind of play with him. And he always dismissed me um, quite aggressively because I don't know how to play. Um, but when this whole thing happened, I called him and said, well, do you want to um, be on stage in two years together? And when he heard about it, it he, he was really into it. So he was the first one that played with self. And what we did is we created a platform where self, as a cybernetic musician, so what we did is basically we merged the musical instrument with the musician. It becomes one. And we create this kind of framework where self can jam or improvise with human musicians, where the music of the drummer here is fed into the neural networks through this dish, through the multi-electrode array, as stimulations, the neurons respond to those stimulations by controlling the, elect the synthesizers, and thus they create some sort of feedback loop where they just play together. And we also added some modules where the musicians, the human musicians, can decide when to um, um, stimulate the neurons through their playing. So really, um, there's a direct communication between the human and non-human to create an improvised post-human um, jam session. Um, this is the, I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I think I'm running out of time, but that's the neural interface that we developed. Um, it's kind of the cent center pillar of the um, um, uh, inside uh, of uh, self, and this is uh, the uh, it's like a, the router that kind of takes the signals out to the, syn uh, the synthesizers, but also kind of directs the stimulations to the neurons. As far as the aesthetics of the piece, um, you know, beyond kind of the art science, bio art if you want, bio robotics if you want, software, ro oh, bio robotics if you want, um, these courses that we're kind of looking at, um, the, as far as, as sound, this um, project is building upon um, the um, tradition of noise as sound. Um, and the first, oh, one of the first people that were talking about it was um, Rusolo, the futurist. And those are his noise machines that he made in the uh, beginning of the 20th century, I think um, early, yeah, early 20th century. And when we kind of read a little bit by text and kind of heard um, some of his works and we looked at this design, that was kind of the starting point for the design of this project because really this whole project is talking about this neural noise. We looked also at the kind of um, big speakers of um, the 50s because, again, we're talking about neural noise, but the project is about amplification. We're taking those kind of millivolts and we're amplifying them. We looked at the um, structure of the cochlea, and that was the 3D design that um, we um, came up with. This is kind of how self works. It's important to kind of mention that self is not only a cybernetic musician, it's also this structure um, doesn't only host the neurons and the um, synthesizers, it's also a full functioning tissue culture lab where you see where the glass is, is a sterile hood where we can feed the neurons. You know, the musicians need to eat. We feed them with media solution and um, the neurons um, reside in an incubator that is heated to 37 degrees with 5% CO2. And there's um, kind of other um, scientific uh, tools to allow us to perform those complex uh, protocols um, on site. So the, I'll just play this one. This is the first test.
This is the first test that we did when we hooked one electrode um, to the neural network. That's the first time that we heard anything sonified um, from the neural network. <laughs> Um, I usually kind of show it because I want to make sure that uh, you understand that you know the sound is like color. The sound is determined by the synthesizers. We can make it sound like whatever we want. So the sound is, to me, less important, even though in the performative kind of setup is very important. And this is where Darren is coming as a performer and a musician. What I kind of more interested is in the form. In the form, I'm, we're talking about the rhythmical behavior of the neurons. And this shows it really well because here there was a one-to-one -one relationship. Every time that it did something, that was an action potential that was kind of fired on this electrode. What we're doing, what we're doing in our performances, we are obstructing the one-to-one -one into kind of one or two levels above that, so we don't lose the data, we don't lose what the neurons are doing, but we still can hear that things are happening in the um, dish. Um, so. This is how it looked in the first performance, and this is how it looked in f other performances. Um, I showed you the 3D um, um, object, so um, that's how it looks. And, and the, the neurons are in this kind of the top where the kind of light is. That's the um, incubator. That's kind of a close-up of it uh, it patched. And this is how the dish looks inside the. Um, Incubator, that's performance that we had in Sydney with Darren and Clayton, John Rose. Um, that's the first culture that we played with. Um, so it's, it's kind of the first generation um, profile, the sterile hood. Um, I have a five minutes um, performance, but I think that we're running out of time. So maybe we'll open it for questions. Listen to it. All right. So that's uh, taken from the first um, performance that we had in Perth. Um, the, uh, uh, the player is a drummer, uh, Darren Moore. He's the scientific director, no, the musical director of the project and part of, uh, is part of self, but he was the first one that played. 
interested in um, yeah, hearing it. It's, um, it's quite incredible. And in this performance in Perth, but also with Schneider, I mean, there's, there was quite a clear sense of communication. And again, I, mean, I don't have a lot of time now to explain a different type of communication that could be, but you know, I mean, in the level of the um, shows that we're doing, which are only 45 minutes long, we can't really talk about learning, but we can talk about um, uh, um, responsive, um, the re response of the network to stimulations. So that, that's basically it. Uh, thank, again for, thank you again for CTM and all the people that are involved. And um, I'm happy to answer questions if they are. Yeah, thanks for this great presentation. Uh, one question. As, as far as I understood you, one of your artistic um, goals was um, to maybe shift uh, our perception of life or vital processes by, by, by looking at these uh, um, processes happening in, in the Petri dish or in any other environment. And um, is, that, is that correct? Did I got that right? <laughs> and... Um, um, I, I was dealing some, for some kind with the question of biological uh, self-organization and, and biogenesis. And, and I remember the work of an of, um, American in the 1960s or 70s. He put just together some proteins and then they were growing some uh, vesicles from this and, and they started pulsating and developing some very primitive meto metabolism. And he said, if I wouldn't know that I'm not a vitalist, I would become one just by observing what is happening. And he found this really amazing. And this is my question to you, some kind of personal question. What, uh, what is your feeling or your perception of what is happening there? Is it, is it um, would you attend more after seeing this or observing this uh, more to a reductionist view of, of life and consciousness or even maybe more to an Epi phenomenal uh, view, or even maybe vitalist view, on on what is what is happening there. And in terms of this artistic work that you just showed at the end, did you really have the feeling that there is some kind of communication between the musician and these cells in the in the petri dish, or is it just some parallel artistic um, process that is that is happening? Um. I really, um, you know, when you quoted this scientist or artist, um, I forgot uh, that kind of talked about vitalism in the context of those um, protein. I mean, I really, uh, I can s really sympathize with that. You know, usually the answer, the questions that I get is, is it intelligent or is it conscious? No, it's not. It's definitely not conscious and it's definitely not intelligent. And, um, I think that we're quite far away from being able to bioengineer intelligence, even though there's quite a lot of um, companies, American companies, that claim that you know if you give them enough money, they'll do it in five years. Um, and you know this is kind of where our work kind of fits in. It's kind of response to those um, claims or um, um, direction, directions, but you know. I don't really know what's happening in those cultures in that kind of level, but I definitely feel um, that they're vital. There's vitalism. Um, they act and they respond in a different way than computers uh, or kind of, um, um, you know, various kind of um, systems um, with kind of feedback modules. Um, so yes, I, I, I feel that there's, I think that there's some sort of a vitality there. But you know, I can't, we, we're not doing an, a scientific experiment. It's, it's not, there's no science. Well, we're using scientific tools, but it's very important to di differentiate it from performing 
a scientific experiment. I mean, science is a methodology that you need to follow in order to kind of have, get conclusions. You have the hypothesis and you have the experimentation, you have the repetition. So we don't have data, but you know, um, I think that when you kind of look at the, um, those networks, and this is kind of how I ended this um, talk, there's kind of different ways of it to, uh, responding. There's one way which is the responsive one, that you know, they respond to stimulation, you know, you zap them and they respond to it. And then um, in that kind of level, it's, uh, scientists are very comfortable to talk about calculations as well. You know, I mean, you can actually get those um, um, neural networks to perform um, really, really simple kind of tasks of calculation. Um, but um, there's quite a lot of scientific data that kind of claims and shows that if you um, stimulate those um, neural networks over time, you may be able to entrain them to actually um, change their um, um, functional plasticity through um, stimulations. Now, we never uh, did any, uh, with self it's impossible to do some, such an experiment because there's a lot of noise in the system. I mean, we'll have to eliminate all the things that we like about self, like the synthesizers, this sort of embodiment, put it in a lab and hook it to a computer. But I think that it would be really interesting with self to um, have a 24-hour performance rather than only 45. That would really kill the joy of the audiences that come to see a show. But I think that it would be extremely interesting to see um, how do they respond over time with repeated um, stimulations. And I think that it's really interesting to use music because and this is why we kind of chose music, and this is why a lot of scientists are very interested in, interested in self or kind of recreating self in a scientific kind of framework because, you know, our brain evolved and there was always kind of music and rhythm there, and there's a lot of data that shows that the evolution of the brain um, uh, um, has uh, to do with um, rhythms and sounds. You know, there was always kind of these kind of factors. So... Um, you know, I can, in Ars Electronica, we played with uh, Huber, uh, Rupert Huber, and he said that, you know, he played, he took a piano to the forest and he played for 24 hours to kind of see if repeated um, frequencies or repeated kind of sounds would kind of elicit um, repeated responses from certain animals. And really, after a while, he, he noticed that there's some sort of a pattern that is emerging, emerging with certain animals that are responding to certain things that he's doing on the piano. And that kind of made me think that really it would be interesting to do it with self over long periods of time. And I would like to do it in kind of a, a artistic context, context. So I have kind of um, long-term um, performances. I don't know, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. So, uh, picking up from there, I was about to ask you what what this network is doing while it's performing. But of course, you say, well, it's very hard to say, like even to describe. I guess well, I was wondering, are they at least? Do you know if they keep growing, or they reach a, a static? No, the neurons are ever changing. They keep on growing. Um, you know, neurons are not proliferating, so they don't divide. So the limit with tissue culture, you know, if you grow skin in petri dish, you can see that, you know, they grow, they grow, they grow, and when the dish is confluent, when there's no space for growing, then they start dying, you know, they're starting to signal, well, this is it, you know, we, we, there's nothing to do anymore. Neurons don't proliferate, they kind of, um, you know, you can, and uh, one of the scientists that I work with, he grew just for the sake of it, a neural network for two years. Um, it's not really sustainable, it's very expensive. It's almost like an art project, really, um, what he did. No, you just, you just grow it in a petri dish, but because it's not proliferating, it's just kind of starting to change. I mean, in my uh, movie, you can see that it, it's growing because they're differentiating, but when, we, when you get kind of a pure population of neurons, this is it, you know? Um, so they ever changing, and the connections would ever change, and the plasticity would kind of be ever changing. 
but and they, they, they're never static, you know, they're alive. So they keep on growing. The, what would be interesting is to see if the changes that they're doing um, changes the, their functional operation, so they do things in a better way. Um, you know, for instance, I know that um, there's um, lots of power grids. You know, power grids are, are controlled by artificial intelligence, uh, neural networks, because neural networks are very good in predicting um, problems. Um, artificial neural networks. Um, and a lot of kind of, of those power grids, they're kind of working with scientists that I know to look at how neural networks solve problems or how, what do they do kind of in culture in order to kind of um, enhance the code of the neural networks. So my other and last question was, um, have you ever tried let a player play with a culture more than once? Like privately or? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would love to do that. And, um, but no, because, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's really expensive to install and, we, you know, traveling with that. And, um, you know, usually we're playing in kind of festivals, so they tell us that we have 20 minutes and then we have to, you know, I mean, it's, it's all very kind of um, always kind of. And um, so we didn't, but I think there are a few musicians and a few scientists that are very interested in that now. So we are applying for a big grant, which is kind of an interdisciplinary grant, that would kind of look at exactly those things um, in a very uh, method methodological and systematic way that we can actually see what they're doing. But you know, um, this is me being really interested in what is happening with them, and we're going to do it, I hope, if we get the grant. But on the other hand, I'm kind of thinking about other projects. I mean, this, this project, can just I can just do it for the rest of my life. Um, but I do, I, I have things, other things that I want to um, achieve and work towards. Um, so, you know, I mean, we really need to kind of frame it as an academic research um, where we have PhD students that are kind of doing work and, you know, it's kind of an ongoing thing. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, um, explain uh, in what ways is um, this um, uh, object of art can differentiate from a great piece of engineering and um, a great piece of engineering and a ways of exploring sound like uh, a new instrument, you know? Um, in what ways makes it like a work of art, like uh, it has its own uh, sensitive approach, like uh, of uh, reality or science. In, in so the question is, why is it an artwork? Something like <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, you know, if it's on the eyes of the beholder, you know, um, engineers are there to solve problems, functional problems, how to build a bridge and get hundreds of people to walk on it. Um, without it collapsing. You know, scientists are trying to kind of um, understand how things work, um, find, um, you know, when it comes to kind of clinical kind of work, to how to kind of cure things. Um, and that's an artwork because, again, I mean, it's not utilitarian. It's exploring cultural ideas and cultural um, questions um, that are generated by the use of those technologies. So really, um, what I usually do is kind of distinct between um, scientists that are kind of using biological technologies in order to find answer to a specific question. How does the brain process, what, what, is, a me what's me what, what is memory? How do you hold the memory in the brain? So you kind of use, we're using those biological technologies, but we kind of bring it into the cultural realm to ask artistic and cultural questions. But I was not comparing like to science in order to answer questions, but more like to perform, like um, uh, engineering is supposed to be functional, like to do something. Science, just like- Scientists perform? Uh, okay. I'm, no, I'm just saying there's theory ob um, objectives, but there are also pra practical objectives to science. That's what mostly differentiates 
um, like functional and theoretic science, but I was more like putting it uh, in a um, functional way of seeing it, because what I see is uh, this uh, piece that you develop with your team um, is supposed to interact with performance. Also, of course, it also has a purpose, like a um, functional pr purpose. Yeah. It was more this what I'm talking. Yeah, but, but I don't see where is the um, problem. I mean, if, if we created or made kind of a music instrument or um, a cybernetic musician that kind of interacts, it's an artistic object that is producing, you know, producing a sound piece, yeah? Maybe I'm not really um, sure what no, you're no, asking. I see, I see as, a, as, a, as a performance, as an object that comes out of this... Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's a performative object. Yes, of course. It's like playing music or mm -hmm. making an instrument is very different. I agree with you. Hi, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you. And I was wondering, first of all, clarification. Um, so the neurons are not making noise. It's you've hooked something up that is making noise to show us how the neurons are changing. Yeah, the neurons control the synthesizer. So they produce um, CV. They produce the control voltages that go through the synthesizer's modules to create sound. Okay. And then um, is there a difference between the sound that is the output if there is no musician playing with them? Well, again, I mean, uh, the, the sound is the same sounds, yeah? The sounds are the same sounds, yeah? Okay. But um, we actually, um, and that's quite frustrating, you know, because we come to a space and we um, patch the synthesizers and we kind of listen to it for a whole day and it sounds great. And then um, the musicians come in and there's like half an hour to the show and they start playing and then it starts sounding really bad. Um, it happened to us a few times. But, but it's not about the musicians or their influence. It's just that um, the data that is streamed into as stimulations to the neurons um, is different and, you know, I mean, maybe elevated um, activity or maybe they become more quiet. The minute that their, their activity is kind of changing, then the way it kind of sounds changes as well. Sometimes it's for good, sometimes it's for bad. But you know, it just happened to us in Ljubljana now that it sounded really good. And half an hour before the show, it just, it was really crappy. And you know, we had to kind of um, um, open the doors probably like um, 20 minutes later because we were just kind of repatching and kind of retry, you know, just kind of play with a few things that so it kind of would sound better. So are they reacting to the vibrations or stimulations this okay so it's everything in the room that they're reacting to no the stimulations are streamed to the neurons through those electrodes that i showed so the music of the musician is streamed to the neurons as stimulations so they do they hear themselves or do they just hear the musician sorry just the, no no <laughs> they just they they hear quote unquote yeah, the uh, musician okay. i mean when we um leave them as an art object in a gallery we patch it in a way so they listen to themselves. It's like that they play solo, yeah? yeah. So they stimulate themselves. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, quick question. Are there any plans for investigating other kinds of stimulation? Like you mentioned, rock stars, so kind of stimulation like sex and drugs, for example, is it like a biological tissue, if it's possible? And well, I, I don't have those plans, but um, um, you know, it depends. Again, I mean, uh, you know, as an uh, as a scientist, it's probably very interesting. Um, as an artist, you need to ask yourself why you're doing it, you know, and. Um, I, um, my next project is, um, n I'm not using neural networks at all, you know, I'm um, more looking at behavior and movement through um, um, the behavior of cardiomyocytes, which are heart muscle cells, um, where I'm kind of trying to grow um, uh, microscopic robotic, autonomous robotic structures that are powered by uh, 
uh, the twitching and the movement of heart muscle cells. Just one more question. Ah, that's it. Do you want to ask a question over there? All right, so that's it.